benefit of the newcomers, but also for others that didn't follow particular discussions. So uh, I'm Nick, for those who don't know me, uh, and I'm convening this, this working group, Statistical Methods and Presentation of Results. Uh, today we have the other convener, Andy. Um, so I put, uh, so you can find this, um, this page from, from the, this, this link here, Topics and Working Groups, and here's just a sort of overview page with a, a link to the meeting. So if you want to click on these links, you'll find um, the, the sort of day by day the several meetings that we had during uh, the week. There's also um, uh, my overview talk I, I uploaded, so if you just click on the introduction for those who didn't see it, have a look through there and see if there's, um, to, to get an overview of the, of the kind of idea of this group. Okay, so for the, uh, so the main thing that we, we kind of discussed last week, um, at least one of the things that came out was a, a sort of splitting into two halves of this working group, or at least the, the stuff we wanted to discuss. So the first is uh, simplified likelihoods, and I'll go on to exactly what that means in a, in a second. And then the second was the presentation of results. So I should say now that pretty much all the discussion was on the first point, and we didn't really discuss or get into anything on, this on the second half, so maybe that's something that we can dig into a little bit more uh, this week. Okay, so the first thing, um, for the benefit of those who don't know, we, we were discussing this, uh, this idea of using simplified likelihoods as an alternative to unfolded um, distributions for reinterpretation of uh, results, particularly for recasting for uh, searches for BSM physics. So the idea is pretty simple. You have some um, fairly basic likelihood uh, for which all of the various pieces of this, this, this likelihood that you need comes pretty much from the experiment. So you have your usual Poisson term for some data that you observe. This can be like in met bins or, or whatever you want. And then there's some constraints for the background terms. These bi, or these theta i rather, uh, get constrained. And this information is now being produced by the experiments. Um, so for example, uh, you, know, you get some covariance like this one down here from CMS, which tells you how these things to be distributed. Um, so at least the way I kind of thought about the, so the people that were interested in, in, in this section, so there's a few names up here, we kind of split ourselves into two, again, into two, two different sides. So the first is, is, is looking at how we get these S terms. So in order to build this likelihood, you need some prediction from, uh, from theory, and then you have to propagate that through into what you would expect to see in your reconstructed uh, space. So you know, your particular met bin, how many events from the signal would you expect? And there's a few different um, there's people here from different uh, frameworks and workflows uh, that actually do this already. Um, so one of the discussions was, was can we try and recast one of the existing CMS analyses, for example, uh, where those ingredients for the rest of it is already there, and, uh, and, and try and see if there's a consistency between the different recasting options that are available. So we have people from um, Smodels that were looking at using efficiency maps. I know now we've got people who work with Rivet and Contour or, uh, and other things. Um, so this discussion is ongoing. With th I think they've kind of, so I, I don't know where where's, where's Ben. Ah, okay. So I don't know if we we finally settled on this particular analysis, but I just put this one here because I know we were discussing it. So this is a particular analysis from CMS, uh, which is a, um, a cons compressed spectra. I think this is a one lepton final state in a cons uh, compressed spectrum, and they give this uh, covariance matrix here, uh, and there's sort of more information on the Twiki there. So in principle, it should be doable to actually pre reconstruct this likelihood and uh, and then the different frameworks will try and attempt to get these SIs and then plug it in and see if they can reproduce the CMS limits. Um, and sort of in the same f uh, uh, theme as that, me and Wolfgang uh, were sort of looking at the, 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 the sort of tools or the, the code to, to actually run this thing. Um, so we each have a different setup, one in Python, one in C++. Um, for the calculation of the limits, and we were basically able to reproduce each other's numbers. So that was quite a nice thing that actually two individuals that are setting up the same thing managed to get the same numbers, which is not maybe as easy as you might expect. Okay, so then the other side of things, um, if I just go back up, up to here again, the other side of things, so if you, if you assume that you get this thing perfectly right, then there's two more elements which you, um, which you might want to uh, consider for the, for the simplified likelihood. So the, the one of the main things about this this procedure is that you make some assumptions here in the distribution of these uh, of, the, of the background yield. So here we've explicitly said, okay, we assume these things to be Gaussian. Moreover, that the it's enough to just describe all of the um, the variation allowed with just a single covariance matrix, and then you you know so this thing is a multivariate Gaussian. This is a linear piece here, and so me and um, Sylvain were looking at ways to 
sort of expand that uh, and try and cover some maybe some edge cases or corner cases where this thing might break down. Um, so there's sort of two two directions we took on that. So the first, actually, you can see a lot of the work here already on the board. The first is to look at this form uh, sort of parameterization that we have here already. So this is the most obvious kind of first order thing that you can think of doing is just to add some deviation from the nominal backgrounds, a linear term here. Um, but instead of that, you can go a slightly more sophisticated route and then think of a better parameterization. So here's an example uh, uh, from Sylvain where he looked at, um, uh, imagine there's just two bins and you have uh, the expressions for the background yields to so something as, you know, this quadratic form. And then if, if you assume that, again, these, these theta constraints are, uh, are uh, um, so this is just a bivariate Gaussian, so they're distributed as a bivariate normal um, distribution. Then you can come up with, um, with these expressions here, which basically match these different coefficients. So you have A1, B1, C1, A2, B2, C2. You match those coefficients with the moments of the, uh, of the distribution. So this is something that we can calculate in toys, the moments, again, like we did uh, already with the, with the covariance matrix, um, and then simply match those to the coefficients. So um, that work is ongoing. There's a Mathematica notebook, which uh, Sylvain has put together to calculate these. And now this week, hopefully, we'll get a chance to actually try and plug that in and see if we can improve on the precision of the, of the likelihood. Uh, the other approach, we'll go right back to the top again. <coughs> so the other approach is rather than messing around with this thing, you can instead mess around with your assumptions over here. So of course you can always swap between those two. And so one idea would be to, to provide a, an alternative way of, of giving this information. So rather than having a, a simple covariance matrix, um, we could actually provide um, numerically what this thing looks like if we had some slightly more information from the experiments, namely some set of Monte Carlo toys. And so here's an idea which I, I quickly managed to throw together some um, pretty simple code to do this. So on the, on the right-hand side, this is again just a two-dimensional example, but of course this expands to however many dimensions you have. Um, if you have uh, a bunch of Monte Carlo toys for what the background uh, yield should be, then you can, you can either plot them as a histogram like this. So this is, if you like, the true distribution. And this is the thing that we would usually approximate with a um, bivariate Gaussian. But if instead you take something like um, a, a density estimator, so this could be a number of different things, but the one I well the one I used here was just a very simple idea where you basically scan through the different uh, uh, regions of this space and then you estimate the density just using a sphere or a ball uh, around each point and just count the number of toys that live inside that ball relative to the total number of toys. So it's, it's really just a very basic estimate of the density. And so here on the left now you see is a top-down view of, of what that PDF should look like from, from this procedure and on the right from the toys. So again, here is, here is a case where we would, uh, we would at first order think of this as you know, approximation with a Gaussian. So that would introduce not only a bias, but also the shape would be kind of wrong. Whereas if you went this sort of more numerical way, you can easily pick up the shape of, of this thing using some other method. So this is the other direction we were thinking of going, is, is, is providing a better estimate for what that density is. Okay, so those are the, the really the main things that were discussed. As I said, all of that is really ongoing, um, and so if if you're interested in any of those aspects, just come and uh, you know attend one of the meetings, and, and, and you know we're definitely welcome to new ideas. As I said, there's a lot of work going on, uh, or we really just started the work in terms of validating the different frameworks using this idea. So uh, we certainly welcome more input there. And then I just listed a few here uh, here a few ideas for the second week. Um, so again, uh, something Darren already mentioned this morning for the simplified likelihood, at least is it would be nice to see a comparison of, of this method with, with unfolded measurements. So again, what can you buy by going into an unfolded space and, and correlating with other things? Um, you know, are there assumptions that go into the unfolding that don't appear in the simplified likelihood or vice versa? So it'd be nice to do a kind of systematic check of that. And we, we had a bit of discussion as well last week about potentially breaking down these, these covariances into different sources. So maybe this is something that's useful for combination, but actually, it would be really nice to identify a particular case where such a combination would be very useful, but actually at the moment impossible. Um, and certainly, you know, this is a good way to get experimentalists to get motivated into providing more information. Um, if you just say, yeah, we would like all this information, uh, it's going to be much harder to get out of them unless you really have a concrete case. Um, and then we briefly touched uh, as well on last week on, on signal correlation. So this is something that's missing, <coughs> excuse me, from the uh, simplified likelihood is the correlations between the different signal terms. Again, this may be something that's completely useless, and hopefully we'll see in the, uh, in the uh, validation kind of exercises whether or not this, uh, this is really Im important for 
um, you know, whether or not your theory correlations with the signal are important for the search and, and whatever. So firstly, can the experiment actually provide anything useful to aid with that? And, and, and is it actually needed? Uh, okay, so then finally, um, the other side of things which we haven't touched on at all is uh, the presentation of results. So any, any input in terms of how the experiments can better present their, um, their results. So, you know, up so in the introduction slide, you'll see I have a few slides which give um, basically what the experiments already provide. So um, anything which could improve, improve there. So for example, uh, you know, naming conventions for different things, correlations between different uh, searches, uh, maybe, you know, introducing some standard workflows or some standard tools that might be useful for, for simplified likelihoods and that kind of thing. And maybe also providing more in terms of uh, multiple dimensional likelihoods instead of just the scans of parameter spaces and that kind of thing. Um, so again, you can go and look at the, the discussions in a bit more detail and, and, you know, what happened in the different meetings using this link here. And uh, I guess at the end of this session, we're going to have a chance to uh, identify any new ideas and people interested in certain things. Uh, can let me know, and I'll, I'll add them to this to this wiki, and hopefully this week we can get a bit more into into that. Okay, so that that was about it. Well, these, these little wiggles. Yeah, yeah. So this is really, the like I say, this is the stupidest thing you could think of doing in terms of estimating this density. And that's just uh, every point in whatever parameter space, you just draw a sphere around that point, count the number of toys that live inside that sphere, and divide it by the total. So even if you have a few, you know, outliers in the distribution, then they're going to get, you know, you're going to get some non-zero probability here. So, th so this one, well, this one uses the toys. That's the point. So you use the you use the to so th these are the real toys, and you you use those toys. So uh, okay, in two dimensions you don't really need it because you get something which is quite smooth already. But if you extract this to eight dimensions, for example, or, or eighty four, then soon the sort of um, you know the curse of dimensionality becomes becomes important. Here you're not really interested in particular axes and bins and whatever. It's it's a continuous um, kind of procedure of, of of drawing this sphere where in any point. Um, but you will pick up wiggles like this, and you can you can do things like you know you can do smoothing, or you can come up with a better estimate, like a kernel density kind of estimate maybe for this instead. As I said, this was just the very first thing that I could do that I could code up in a you know a couple of hours, and then it was it was fine. Any more questions? Easy. Experiments. So I will just uh, give a few uh, reminders. Also, I mean, some kind of new ideas related to new kind of detector that can be used to look for beyond standard model physics, so in an other additional ways to look for beyond standard model physics. I will mention some work that we started last, last week, which is the search for action, and uh, again, a new method to look for this. And also, so both at the LHC and the FCC. And the second topic that we discussed also last week is another way to look for invisible objects uh, at the LHC. So, ah, there is a problem because there are two slides uh, side by side, but okay, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> if not, it's fine for me. I mean, okay, so we'll go uh, step by step. So the, um, an example for new detectors at the, the LHC. So these are the, the idea to detect, in fact, intact protons in the final state, so either in QCD exchange, so you have here two gluons which are exchanged, or via photon exchange, so you need a colorless object to be exchanged in order to the proton to be intact. So the idea to extend a bit the reach at the LHC is to have this kind of detector which will allow to enrich the what we can do in terms of beyond standard model physics at the LHC and then beyond, for instance, at the FCC. 
So that's why so the detectors were installed now both in Atlas and uh, CMS with these projects which are called AFP for Atlas Forward Proton and CPPPS for CMS Totem Precision Proton Spectrometer at about 210 meters from the interaction point. So basically, to just to give you some uh, feeling on the kind of mass we are sensitive, when I'm talking a mass in the two jets, or the mass of the system X, which is here in the case of two photon exchange, just to give you some ideas, there is some acceptance for standard LHC running between 400 GeV up to 2 TeV. I mean, just to give you some mass, uh, order of mass in which we are sensitive. So basically, I will discuss very briefly the anomalous coupling, as I mentioned, and also the reach for the, the action that we are now working on. So here on this slide, you have a view on the CMS project. So that's why there were these Roman pot detectors which were installed uh, again about 200 meters from the interaction point. And it's just a photo from the tunnel where we see the detectors which are located here. And they can detect basically the protons which are scattered at small angle, intact protons in the final state. And uh, I, I should mention that there will be a, a talk by Gustavo this afternoon. So I will mention also the data which were already taken last year using these detectors. And we accumulated already about 15 inverse centobarn of data uh, last year. And this year, we are running basically each time uh, CMS is running. So OK, so I have always both slides, but okay. I think it's fine. Maybe it's a bit small, but I don't know why <laughs> it's doing this. But anyway, so the, uh, the first topic that we started a few years ago, basically also with uh, Gero and Sylvain who are, uh, who are here, is looking for this uh, anomalous coupling. So for instance, gamma gamma WW for photon anomalous coupling, or also gamma gamma ZZ, or gamma three photon, gamma gamma gamma, and one Z boson. So the idea was to study this uh, process uh, with, the, again, the two protons intact in the final state, and you observe the W pair either in ATLAS or in CMS, or here, for instance, the photon pair in ATLAS and CMS. And I put here a few uh, references here for people who want to know a bit more. And the motivation is to look for quartic uh, four-photon anomalous coupling, in the case of the four-photon, for instance, and how you can modify it with respect to the standard model is via loop of new particle or via new resonance. So for instance, there are two effective operators at low energies, which are written here. And in the case of loop, you get this uh, coupling. So it's proportional to the force power of the charge divided by the force power of the mass of the particle in the loop, and also proportional to the spin. And for, let's say, standard kind of beyond standard model physics, we can expect a coupling of the order of 10 to minus 14, 10 to minus 13. And in the case of the resonance, so you have this value of the coupling, which is proportional to the power minus 2 of the coupling, gamma gamma to x, which produces a new resonance, and also proportional to the mass of the particle in the resonance to the power minus 2, and again proportional to the spin. And as well as an example, so 2 dV, 2 TV dilatons leads to a coupling of about 10 to minus 13. Yes, so this is, a, this is in GV minus 4. So, so just the one uh, aside which I wanted to mention at the LHC, and this will be true also for the future project that I will discuss uh, briefly later at the FCC. So in order to get lots of luminosity at these colliders, the way we do it is to have many interactions per bunch crossing. So this is what we call pileup, basically. So just as an example, this is the event in which you are interested. You have two photons in Atlas or CMS, and the two intact protons originating from the same interaction. And one background, which is called pileup, is like this, where you have the two photons, again, coming from this interaction, but the pro intact protons are originating from secondary interaction. So of course, this kind of events you want to reject. So how are we doing this? This is where basically tagging the proton is very important or is really fundamental to get rid of this background. And it's just illustrated on these two plots, which are here. So this is basically, let me go back one slide to show the diagram. So what we do is for our events, if you measure the mass of the two proton system and the mass of the two photon system, it should be identical within resolution because we produce two protons in the final state plus two photons and nothing else. And the same for the rapidity distribution, the rapidity of the diphoton system and the rapidity of the two proton system should be also identical. And it's illustrated on this plot where you have the ratio of the mass of the two protons divided by the mass of the two photons. So this is the signal which is here. And this is the result from the two photon plus pileup. Because of course, in the case of the pileup, the two protons have nothing to do with the two photons. So there is no match between the diphoton mass and the two proton mass. 
And the same for the difference in pseudo rapidity, or a rapidity, in fact, here. So where you have the difference in rapidity between the two photon and the two proton, so picking around zero for our signal, and that photon plus pile up is basically a continuous distribution. So what you see basically tagging the proton in the final state allow us to get a negligible background for about 300 inverse femtobarn at the LHC. So I don't want to enter on the detail because of the lack of time, but this is basically all the cuts, and you see that we get about 0.2 events for 300 inverse femtobarn. So any observation is basically a beyond standard model event. And for typical values, again, of a coupling of a over uh, 10 to minus 14, we expect something like 30 events for 300 inverse femtobarn. Okay, so the reach that we obtain, again, I will not enter into the detail because I want to move to the more important part is what we want to do new, I mean, at this workshop related to this. But I needed to introduce this so that we could understand what we want to do. So this is the, the four photon anomalous coupling and the reach that we can have with 300 inverse femto barn. So you see that we get something which is a few 10 to minus 14 or down even to ten a few 10 to minus 15 in the kind of 95% confidence level limit. And if I want to compare to the standard reach at the LHC without detecting the proton in the final state, we gain about two orders of magnitude. So we are really, we reach sensitivity to some models like our composite Higgs model or also some extra dimension kind of model. So this is one of the best way to study this kind of anomalous coupling. And just as a side remark, I mentioned that we studied also, for instance, three photon plus one Z, so gamma, 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 Z coupling. And there we gain even more compared to the standard search at the LHC, we gain about three orders of magnitude on the value of the coupling. So this is really the way if you want to look for this kind of uh, anomalous coupling. And again, the anomalous coupling can be due to loops of new particles or new kind of resonance that uh, would appear uh, and which are coupled to photon. So what we are thinking here is basically to look a kind of generalization of these studies looking for axions. So this is the present situation now in terms of uh, the, the coupling and mass of the action. So you see it's mainly a low mass experiment because it's a logarithmic scale. And the LHC is here. So it's rather at high mass, as you can see, above uh, basically 10 GeV up to 1 TeV, which is here. So what we are trying to do during uh, this meeting, and hopefully there will be some news by the end of the, the workshop, uh, if everything works fine, is to see how using the same technique we can, uh, the laser, laser, yeah, how using the same techniques by detecting the two photons in the final state. So basically you have gamma, gamma going to action with decay in two photons. We can improve the reach of the LHC towards basically lower values of the coupling. So this region and maybe to higher mass. So how, since we do, we improve a lot the situation using the tagging in the proton in the standard quartic anomalous coupling for f uh, two photons, we can have the idea that we will gain also on the reach with respect to action at high mass, because at low mass probably will not be competitive, but at least at high mass. So this is what we aim to do. So just now I wanted to introduce, of course, the high luminosity LHC, because the idea is also to investigate if we can do better concerning this using the high luminosity LHC. So the idea is to accumulate about 200 in this inverse, uh, 250 inverse femtobarn per year over tw 12 years, which means about 3,000 inverse femtobarn. So, and then I want to open also one of the questions that was raised at the beginning of this workshop, but since there are much more people uh, here, I mean, ma many more people are, also of course, welcome to our working group. And the main question is which physics can be done with 3,000 inverse femtobarn that cannot be done with 300, which would be the amount of luminosity that we will get at the end of the next run of the LHC. So also detectors can be improved, and I will come to this in a moment. As an example, I will discuss very briefly some ideas to put fast timing detectors everywhere in CMS and ATLAS. So this is something that is, no, is not existing for now. And you can measure the time of flight of all the particles because the idea is to install fast timing detectors in the central part of CMS and ATLAS and also in the forward part of CMS and ATLAS. So this, uh, in fact, is very useful if you want to construct the vertex, so to know from which vertex the particles are coming. And the typical resolution that we aim to get, I would say, is 15 to 20 picosecond. I mean, uh, if everything works fine, which means this is uh, in a space is of the order to four to five millimeters, typically. So we aim to get this kind of precision to know within four or five millimeters where each particle which are produced in the final state are coming from. So this is the, the target. So, and this is something that we discussed also here last week, 
about uh, some way to look what we call for invisible object in CMS or in Atlas. I mean, but we started this in CMS. So just at a gener generic discussion, there is no concrete result on this uh, uh, now. So the idea is again to look at uh, two photon exchange events. Again, protons intact to the final state. And then you produce either a pair of dark matter particles or you produce some monopole, so whatever you want. But the important point is that these are invisible objects, so they cannot be detected. So they can appear at missing ET, maybe, because there are two of them. So in cases, it will be missing energy and not missing transverse energy. So it should be just missing energy. And two intact protons in the final state. So what is the idea between this? So in fact, let's assume that this pair is at high mass. Let's say of the order of one TeV, for instance, or two TeV. So if you compute the mass of the two protons in the final state, since we have, again, an exclusive production, these two protons will indicate a mass of two TeV. But you see nothing in CMS or ATLAS. So you see a kind of missing energy, so incompatibility between the information of the two protons with what is observed inside ATLAS. So how to see this kind of event? So we request high mass objects inside the Roman pot, so this is the proton detected. We find the vertex where these protons are coming from using the fast timing detectors that are also installed for this proton detector. And then we will request no particles emitted from that vertex, which is reconstru reconstructed using the timing time. So it's not something simple, that's clear, I mean, because we need to understand very precisely the timing detectors. This is also within the precision, within the resolution of the timing detector, but this is basically the global idea. So let me just mention a bit briefly so the about this kind of events. It's clear that the vertex where the dark matter particle or the monopole are produced is not known, because we don't observe the particle in CMS or ATLAS. So the only way we can access this vertex is using the two protons in the final state, because this is the only thing that we see inside the detector. From this, we measure very precisely the time of flight, and we get the vertex of the interaction using the timing detector. And again, this is a precision with, let's say, we hope to get 10 to 15 picoseconds for this detector, so something down to three millimeter precision as an order of magnitude. So we now assume that we measure the time of flight of all the particles produced in the very forward region in addition to the central part, so this means that basically we have timing detectors installed everywhere in CMS and ATLAS, which is basically being discussed right now. And this is the, the project that is going on in both collaboration, to have it for high luminosity LHC. And then we ask that we know from which vertex the all the particles which are produced are origi originating using, again, the time of flight information, and also the vertex in case it's the acceptance of the tracking. So, and then we need to request that there is an incompatibility between the two proton vertex, which is found using the time detectors, and the vertices using the particle in the forward region or in central region. In central region, it's easier because you reconstruct directly the vertex using the track. So this is basically the basic idea. And for these events, if there is this incompatibility, this would be a candidate for this kind of in invisible object. So for now, it's just an idea. I would say there are many uh, questions understanding of the detector, what is the pileup background, because we are talking about 200 pileup events per uh, budge crossing. So all of this, of course, has to be simulated and studied in more detail. This is just an idea on the board uh, right now, but we started to discuss it uh, uh, last week. OK, so then there is another topic which is very interesting, also related to uh, mass coupling or beyond model physics, which is the higher energy LHC. So you probably heard that there is a proposal to have a higher energy machine at the LHC. And the strategy is to develop the 16 Tesla magnet that would be needed both for the high energy LHC and then later on for the FCC. And this machine should be 28 to 33 TeV. It would not run before 2035 because it would be after the high luminosity LHC. And at least what is a good sign, it appeared for the first time in the long-term plan of CERN very recently. I mean, it was last month that for the first time there was a bullet putting this high energy machine the difficulty is that it should stand within the CERN budget. So there will not be additional money to go for this machine if we do decide to go for it. Concerning the next uh, other project that you, you know, of course, is the ILC and the CLIC. So the, the ILC, the, the main project in, uh, in Japan, so there are two, two phases. So this is first 200 to 500 GeV, and then one TeV, 
with a time scale which could be 2030 to 2035 and then 2045. So and this is clearly complementary to the hadronic machine and maybe the higher energy LHC or the high luminosity LHC. And there is some discussion now for this project. There may be some decision soon and nothing is decided, of course, up to now. And there is a click at LHC, which is 3 TV machine, but it depends, of course, also on the FCC project. Click and FCC will not exist. Both of them will not exist, obviously, because of the, the cost. So then there is the FCC, which is a long-term perspective. We are talking about 2045, 2080. So uh, the energy frontier, both for a collider, circular collider for leptons and hadrons, or also electron uh, proton collider. It's a long-term project, of course, no decision, not decided, but it would not start before 2045. So it's a long time from now, but this is still the right time to think about it if we want to have a detector and a machine design which is optimal for the searches that we want to do. And something I would like to mention, that if people are interested, basically, uh, they should come to us in the workshop to discuss this point. Because the idea is to get this FCC an 80 to 100 kilometer machine. So the electron machine is 88 to 370 GeV, hadron machine up to 100 TeV. And uh, basically, there is also a complement complementary project in China. But the important point is that the, the design of the machine is, of course, far from being finalized. I mean, we are talking about the 2045 time scale, so there is 30 years I mean, to, to, to do and to do the design which means that now what the, the request we have from the machine people is which kind of detectors you need. Do you need a very good for, uh, forward coverage, for instance, coverage in the forward dire direction at high rapidity? So this will be some application on the magnets on the machine to focus the beam. So this is all these kind of questions are still open. So also, do you, do you want to have some space to, to detect intact proton in the final state, as another example? So this is now the, the time to mention what we would like. So it's the time to think about an ideal detector where it would be ideal to do some beyond standard model searches and see if it's possible to have some machine which is compatible for this kind of detector. And we have the possibility to do it now because again, the people are doing some brainstorming about the structure of the machine and they, are, they, are well, uh, they welcome really the discussions about the design of the machine with respect to the detector that we would like to include. And they even told us, I mean, if you think about different kinds of detectors which are targeting different kinds of physics, for instance, if there are some measurements which require extremely high rapidity coverage, you could think to have a very long detector. There could be some dedicated detector for this kind of measurement. So because the number of interaction points is also not decided so th inside the machine. So there are some possibility to do some brainstorming also about this. Okay, so now let me conclude, so it's not as exhaustive, but I think there is a high discovery potential, of course, for LHC and FCC. So I mentioned the anomalous coupling and something we started, uh, the actions, and also this looking for invisible objects. So there are many other topics, and especially since there are so many new people, so you are welcome to join probably tomorrow. We'll have another brainstorming uh, session to discuss uh, in which topics people are interested. So there are many different topics, so discovery potential, Higgs physics, measurement of standard model, or QCD, because of course there is a completely new kinematical domain in QCD with saturation effects. Neutrinos also, there, a, there was a talk that you can see at the beginning of the workshop about neutrinos. So, and again, so what I wanted to stress, think about new kinds of detectors. If you need to go closer to the beam, higher rapidity, fast timing detectors, proton detectors, that open more physics topic to be studied, especially for the FCC, since the, the machine design is not finalized. And I just want to finish by welco welcoming uh, everybody to our uh, physics working group. So thank you.